We now have uh, production-ready Kubernetes in OpenStack public clouds. So please make uh, Fei Long Wang and Zhang Xiao Yu welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our session. Uh, my name is Fei Long Wang. I'm the head of uh, Catalyst Cloud, uh, head of development at Catalyst Cloud. And my friend, uh, Xing Chao Yu, uh, he's a senior engineer from our ops team. So in today's session, we're Should just turn off this one. Yeah. So in this session, it's pretty much a, a journey of our journey to build a production-ready managed Kubernetes service on top of our public cloud. So who we are? Uh, Catalyst Cloud is a public cloud service based in New Zealand. And currently, we are running uh, three regions across New Zealand. And we have one region at uh, Hamilton, and uh, one region at Poirua, and one region at uh, Wellington. And that's pretty much what the service we can provide now. Uh, we can provide public cloud service and um, private cloud service as well. So um, what is OpenStack? Uh, if you are currently in this session, I assume you should know a little bit knowledge about either OpenStack or Kubernetes. Is there any people never hear about either OpenStack or Kubernetes? Yeah, no. OK, so just in case, OpenStack is um, a set of open source services so you can use the building and manage cloud, uh, cloud computing platforms. And it's fully open source. And um, back to that, it's probably all the biggest companies around all the world. Uh, and currently, it's managed by OpenStack Foundation. And uh, as for Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, is open source container orchestration system. Firstly, it's launched by Google and currently is managed by uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So, um, the managed Kubernetes service we're running, we probably, I mean, Catholic Cloud currently probably the, um, the first uh, certified Kubernetes service in New Zealand. We get is fully certified by uh, CNCF. So when we see that, um, you can see it's fully uh, open sourced and uh, certified by CNCF because we can fully pass the um, conformance testing uh, provided by CNCF. So that means um, you can run your current uh, containerized application on Catalyst Cloud, and meanwhile, you can just port it to any other Kubernetes service, like um, GKE or uh, AKS, EKS, whatever. So, because we, we think the portability of um, application of your container is the most important uh, feature when you're running um, a containerized application. So, when we say a Kubernetes running on OpenStack, it's pretty much an um, uh, architecture like this. So under the hood is your standard hardware, and on the hardware is your OpenStack uh, shared service, like um, if you have some knowledge of, uh, uh, about OpenStack, like NOAA. NOAA is um, stand for the compute service, and the networking, we are using Neutron and uh, Cinder for the storage service, and a lot of uh, other services as well. And on top of that, you can get a, a hypervisor like um, KVM, and meanwhile, you can use a bare metal service like Aeronic. And on top of the water machine, because currently uh, at um, 
Castry Cloud, we are only offering the, uh, the Kubernetes running on virtual machine, not ironic, not uh, bare metal. So when you use or create a cluster, it's most like you get, um, for example, you are building a three master and a two worker nodes Kubernetes cluster. Generally, you um, OpenStack Magnum, OpenStack Magnum is a service uh, we are using to provision the Kubernetes uh, cluster for you. So you can get um, master node, three master nodes. All the three master nodes create um, based on a virtual machine. And meanwhile, you can get um, two uh, worker nodes, and each of them also running on a, a virtual machine. And on top of the, uh, the worker node, you can have your, um, your container, like Docker or other uh, container service. So the next question, we were talking about um, Kubernetes on OpenStack. The, question, the next question you could be asked is, um, why I have to uh, use a managed Kubernetes service instead of just build um, uh, a Kubernetes service by ourselves, just run it on a bare metal? So there is an, a, new, uh, a news last week from um, Atlassian to just, there is a, uh, administrator from uh, Atlas and just admitted Kubernetes maintain and set up Kubernetes is a hard way. And they don't recommend um, the others do the same because it is very hard. And meanwhile, another um, repo I would like to share with you guys is there is a repo from AKS from uh, Microsoft for the, uh, the Azure service. There's a question just ask, uh, is AKS ready for production? And some people just say, uh, unfortunately, I to, need to agree uh, with somebody, AKS is not production ready. So don't get me wrong, I'm not, not talking about uh, AKS is not good, or I'm also not talking about uh, Catalyst Cloud is better than AKS, I'm just saying, building a production-ready Kubernetes service is not easy. And I think that's why um, we are, what we would like to share is um, the journey and our experience with you guys so you guys can just avoid some uh, black hole somewhere. So what is production-ready means? Production-ready means um, the author of the code probably believe um, is ready to run on a production environment, but there is no single um, criteria side to say uh, what is production ready means. So different engineers could have different um, beliefs for, for what about uh, production ready, but here just some um, uh, source what we think is production ready. So the first thing is the, the system, the service you're running should have very strong data security because when we say production, it means the user running the service very, very care about the, production, uh, the security and high availability, high availability and uh, resiliency. And another thing is the service must have very good performance and scalability. And the last one is easy of use. That means um, they would like to get very good user experience from the service. So um, back to the, um, the Kubernetes, what is a strong data security means for, uh, for Kubernetes cluster? So the first thing uh, we care about is the RBAC backend by Keystone. Keystone is um, the authentication service in OpenStack. So we would like to see um, user can use their existing username and password with OpenStack, and they don't have to, to create another user username password on top of Kubernetes. They can just use their existing OpenStack account to talk to your Kubernetes cluster. 
And another thing is uh, uh, the network policy. So if you are not with, uh, very familiar with network policies, that basically means um, how a pod can talk to another pod in your Kubernetes cluster. And as for network policy, currently we are using uh, Calico. The default uh, is, is like a network driver for your uh, Kubernetes cluster. The default implementation uh, in OpenStack Micro is uh, Flano, but when, based on our testing, the, uh, the performance of Flano is not very good. So we just, and, we are, and Flano doesn't support our network policy. So based on our testing, we just um, go for the Calico and uh, employ, implement the driver in OpenStack Micro. And another thing is um, the rolling upgrade and patching. So for example, um, you are running uh, some of the uh, Kubernetes version and there is a bug or a security issue in that version and you need uh, an upgrade. So user won't want to see uh, the, the service running on that Kubernetes cluster is interrupt or down, any downtime. So that's why we uh, would like to see a rolling upgrade supported by the, uh, the Kubernetes cluster. Currently, that part of work is um, uh, proposed by CERN. CERN is um, the physical, I can't remember the, the full name. It's from the, uh, the, the Europe uh, Nuclear uh, Research Institute. And as for high availability and resiliency, uh, generally we care about uh, two parts. One is the, one is, uh, uh, the high availability for master nodes. Master nodes currently we can support, when you create the cluster, uh, you can select how many master nodes you would like to create. For example, I would like if you really want a high availability for your Kubernetes cluster, you have to create at least three master nodes because um, there is a limitation, not limitation. For ETCD cluster, you have to uh, get three uh, nodes for your ETC cluster to get the high availability. And for worker nodes, uh, I think it's just built in uh, high availability feature from Kubernetes. If you're using a uh, rapid site, uh, it will cross, uh, create the, the conta your container across all the uh, uh, worker nodes. If there's any worker nodes down, your application won't be impacted. Uh, and another feature we care about is auto healing. So auto healing is most like um, uh, a further step for the high availability for worker nodes. So for example, when one of your worker nodes uh, down, you would like to see uh, the Kubernetes cluster can fix, can repair the cluster automatically by himself. So currently the solution we are proposing to uh, OpenStack community is we are using uh, node problem detector plus Drino and plus autoscaler. So Drino is a very small uh, service. Uh, it will just monitor the status of uh, uh, your nodes, and if there's anything wrong, uh, based on the given condition, it will um, call in and unschedule that, um, that worker nodes. And then autoscaler will just replace that node with um, a new node to get the auto-healing uh, auto feature. And uh, another part is um, good performance. So for network performance, uh, as I mentioned about, we are using Calico because uh, the default network driver uh, in OpenStack Magnum is Flano and it's, based on our testing, it's not very good. So uh, we switch to Calico and GKE, the Google uh, Kubernetes engine, is also using uh, Calico as um, uh, the network driver. 
And as for storage performance, we, we didn't do anything. We just used the, uh, the default support from Cinder, from OpenStack Cinder to get um, basically the, the, the raw performance. <coughs> and another thing about performance is the time to deploy a cluster. So currently in, in, in Catalyst Cloud, we are providing two templates. One template is uh, the development template. With the development template, by default, you only get uh, one master node and one work node. So it's about take like five or 10 minutes. And when you want to create a, a, a production temp, a cluster with a production template, like for example, you will get a two load balancer on front of your multiple masters. So for the two load balancer, under the hood, OpenStack need to create at least four um, virtual machine to get the cluster, uh, to get the, the load balancer. And you have to create um, like three, for example, three master nodes. And meanwhile, you will also create um, like more than uh, two or three worker nodes to get a, a production uh, Kubernetes cluster. So, so it's pretty much a, a big stack. And currently in our uh, cloud, it takes like uh, 15 minutes. It's, it's not very um, short because for, for it means for somebody, it means like uh, several cups of coffees. But we are, we're improving that. And um, another, li another limitation for now is we're using we're getting the, all the Kubernetes uh, Docker image from uh, Docker Hub. And that means uh, when user create a cluster, OpenStack Magnum need to talk to, Open, uh, talk to uh, Docker Hub, whatever, where the, uh, the Docker Hub servers, so probably out of New Zealand. So the network latency uh, could affect the, uh, the performance. So, our work, well, our plan is we will create, um, build a local uh, container registry. So when create this cluster, OpenStack Magnum just need to talk to uh, a, a local register, con uh, the container registry to get the community's image. It could improve the, uh, the building performance. And another thing about the horizon uh, is a horizontal scalability. So the idea is currently, for example, you have a production uh, 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 Kubernetes cluster based on the production template. You have, for example, two or three worker nodes. But your uh, application is getting more traffic, and you would like to see the cluster can be scaled automatically based on the, uh, the workload on your cluster. So it's also related to the, the auto healing. So currently we are also proposing the uh, same solution, like we're using autoscaler, Kubernetes autoscaler to get the, uh, the metrics, the workload metrics from Kubernetes cluster. And uh, that autoscaler will talk to OpenStack, like uh, for example, NOAA or Heat or Magnum to get more worker nodes and get it into the existing Kubernetes cluster to implement the, the auto-scaling. So the last part is uh, easy of use. So most of the, the, the customers we are engaging, they're using uh, either Terraform or Ansible to talk to uh, OpenStack API. So for OpenStack Magnum, we are also providing uh, API, so user can just use their favorite uh, tools like Ansible or Terraform to talk to OpenStack Magnum API to create or delete, uh, manage your cluster. And we fully upstream all the work we have done for um, the support for Terraform and Ansible. Yeah, to be more clear, all the work we are working are upstream. We don't have any secret code for, uh, just for Catalyst Cloud. 
all the work we have done just upstream. And if you're running your own open stack, you can just get the code from upstream and build by yourself. It's uh, and another thing is a resource cleanup uh, before deletion. It's, as before, it's um, uh, a little bit difficult because uh, when, when Kubernetes cluster creates, um, for example, a persistent volume or uh, a load balancer to expose your, your service, the, the end hood, OpenStack, have no idea which volume which load balancer created on top of your uh, Kubernetes cluster. So there was some uh, limitation, but recently we just um, upstream some uh, solution to inject the, uh, the cluster name or cluster ID into the, uh, the metadata of your persistent volume or the load balancer. So when user delete their uh, Kubernetes cluster, OpenStack Magnum can detect uh, which volume and which load balancer created by this uh, Kubernetes cluster. So OpenStack uh, Magnum can do some clean up on behalf of um, the administrator. And another thing is the integration with um, the, the Anderhood OpenStack uh, infrastructure service. So this is, uh, uh, the diagram how uh, Kubernetes integrate with OpenStack. So the first thing is we have a, a dashboard. So on the dashboard, you can just click to, with several click, you can get a new Kubernetes cluster. It's very easy. You don't have to deal with a kube.min or minikube and something like that, just click. And meanwhile, we also uh, support uh, uh, premises out-of-box premises to help you monitor uh, your application running on top of the, uh, the Kubernetes cluster. And for, for authentication and authorization, uh, currently OpenStack Magnum can integrate with, and your Kubernetes cluster can integrate with Keystone. Keystone is um, our service of OpenStack. Uh, we also propose that feature uh, into um, OpenStack community for upstream. And network, network, uh, as I mentioned, we are using Neutron and there is no work need to be done because uh, when you build a, a Kubernetes cluster, basically you just care about the network on top of Kubernetes. You don't have to worry about the, the network and the hood. And for virtual machine, uh, is just use NOAA, the <laughs> compute service of OpenStack. And for block storage, uh, you can just, when you create a cluster and uh, create any pod to get the, uh, the support from persistent volume, you just create a, a persistent volume as euro and OpenStack Magnum, the and the Kubernetes. We will talk to OpenStack Cinder to create the volume as euro. Is, Nothing to be done. And for Magnum, uh, for OpenStack, for OpenStack object storage, uh, OpenStack Magnum also support when user create um, a new cluster, they can specify a label if I want to get a, a private container registry. So, for example, you can just give when you create the, uh, the cluster, you can, you can just give it a label uh, like um, private registry enabled equals to, and then after that you can get um, a new private container registry and using OpenStack uh, Swift at the backend to, st uh, to store your uh, container images. Uh, and another integration is, very important integration, integration is uh, the load balancer. Currently we are offering the uh, Octavia Octavia is the load balancer service of OpenStack and is fully integrated with, uh, with Kubernetes now. So when user creates a, a, a new service and with load balancer at the tab, at the service tab, OpenStack Magnum will just talk to um, uh, 
magnum to create a new uh, load balancer and expose it. So here's a work, uh, what we are still working on. Uh, for upstream, as I mentioned, currently we're working on health check. Health check means um, OpenStack Magnum, or we just say OpenStack. OpenStack will uh, check the health status of your community's cluster. And if there's something wrong with your worker nodes or your master nodes, um, with auto healing, we can get it fixed automatically. So, yeah, get your life easier. And rolling upgrade is taking a long time for upstream work uh, and still end the review and test. Hopefully, we can get it merged in this cycle. And Octavia ingress controller. So, ingress controller. Let's say it um, with an easy way. So when you want to expose your uh, service on Kubernetes cluster, you can expose it with load balancer. But that means if I have three uh, service I want to expose, that means you have to create three load balancers. That means you get um, more cost for that. But if you use, you're using um, ingress controller, you probably just need one, one load balancer with three uh, ingress controller. So you can sell your money. And another thing we are working on about uh, the ingress controller is in integration with the DNS service. DNS service in, in OpenStack named uh, Designit. So that's another part we are working on. Uh, all above um, upstream work. All the, all the code will be upstream to OpenStack community. And for Catalyst Cloud side, uh, as I mentioned, currently we're still using uh, Docker Hub as our uh, container registry. So next step we are working on uh, is building our private dedicated uh, container registry. So user, when users create a new cluster, they don't have to talk, you know, cross the sea to somewhere to get the image, just use local image. Uh, and we probably need um, a dedicated service. So when you user create a multi-master for your Kubernetes cluster, for each uh, master node in the etcd cluster, they need to know which cluster I belong to. I, they just need a discovery service to know each other. So currently we're using the etcd.io. Uh, it's not a, a, a very good one. We need probably need to build our uh, dedicated private uh, discovery service. Okay, uh, that's pretty much my part. So um, next, my, my friend uh, Xing Chao will introduce um, more about production writing we're thinking about. Thank you, Philo. So uh, we just uh, talked about the production ready about the Kubernetes cluster. We more focused on the end user's perspective. Now, um, as a cloud operation engineer, I would like to uh, change our view to see more about what, what we need to do and how could we do to provide a, a pro production ready cluster for our customers. So when we talk about production ready, we not only mean the code security, we not only mean the scalability or high availability, we also mean uh, the code quality, the high code quality to compose the, of, of our systems. We also um, talk about our monitoring and the alert system to keep our um, system healthy. We also talk about our changes uh, transparent to our end users. We also talk about our deployment, which contains new features, bug, bug fix, or configuration changes are safe and quick. Um, so all of these need a robust and a strong CI and CD systems to support them. CI means how we uh, build and test our codes and systems. 
and the CD means how do we to deliver them. Uh, before we start to introduce our CI systems, uh, let me uh, explain why do we need to maintain Kubernetes. Uh, as you know, we have two types of projects. One project is uh, written by ourselves, and the other one is the projects from the open source community. As Philo said, we do not reserve any private parts uh, in our Kubernetes. We prefer to contribute our changes to the com community. We usually use the upstream directly as our uh, source code, but um, in some cases, we have to maintain them. Um, for example, we are using 1.11 um, version as our Kubernetes uh, release. Um, there is uh, one bug we, rec we recently encountered is um, in some cases, the Kubernetes nodes will lose its internal and external IP occasionally, which is a critical uh, issue for our customers. So uh, in this case, the community has do the bug fix in the latest uh, uh, release, but there is a delay in the earlier branch or releases. So we need to do the bug backfog on, on the one port 11 branch. So that's the reason we need to maintain Kubernetes. <clears throat> so uh, this is the CI pipeline for building and testing our Kubernetes. Uh, as you can see from the bottom of the picture, um, when the when the patch has been submitted to our GitLab, it will trigger CI pipeline work to uh, create a new doc, Docker uh, container which contains OpenStack client uh, Ansible and uh, private SSH keys for next step use. Um, then, uh, the, then the container will will try to run some Ansible playbooks to call our Catalyst public cloud to uh, create uh, uh, required network storage and computing resources for testing and build use. Uh, when all of these resources are ready, um, um, the instance for building will, will try to uh, fetch the source code from our Git remote host and uh, trying to build the new Kubernetes, Kubernetes image, images. And uh, when all of the images has been built, it will try to tag and push the images to our internal Docker registry. Uh, and uh, in the next step, we will create uh, some instance for testing. It will, it will run uh, uh, Kube admin to create uh, a Kubernetes cluster and uh, will install required network add-ons. And then we will run our test suite to make sure our new build Kubernetes cluster are okay with our new images. When all of the test has passed, it will publish the new build uh, you build Kubernetes images to our Dog Hub, uh, Dog Hub account. So this is uh, one of the CI pipeline in our CI systems. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce our open source tools in our CD systems. Uh, as you know, we have a, a lot of choice to uh, make up a CI or a CD systems. Um, we we are not intended to judge which uh, tools are better or, or not. We, we just uh, choose, we choose them because they are suitable for our current scenario use. Um, Redmine is an uh, issue track we used in our CD systems. We use them to allocate um, feature development uh, or bug fix or configuration changes we also use uh, Garrett as our code review 
uh, code review pro um, uh, project. This is an open source project uh, from Google. Uh, we usually will allocate two or three people to uh, do the code review to make sure we are we are all happy with the changes. We also will add some special tags in our commit message to give the real reveal a clear idea about how, which, which systems it will affect and uh, which roles and uh, nodes it will affect. And uh, at the same time, when the patch has uh, submitted to our code review system, it will trigger Jenkins to run build and uh, test uh, jobs. Um, it uh, usually will include the lint test, the unit test, and the integration test. Um, and uh, when uh, the test has finished, it will respond the result on our uh, code review system um, automatically. And the next, next part is about our configuration management systems. We use Puppet and Ansible for our configuration management and orchestration. They all use the human-friendly YAML format to uh, manage the data. So we choose them. And uh, we also have a, a pre-release environment which has the similar uh, network topology and service architecture and the same software version as our production environment. Um, in pre-production pre environment, we will run our puppet, puppet models man manifest and uh, Ansible playbooks to make sure everything is fine in them. Then we have the confidence to do the same thing on our production environment. And uh, before we doing the uh, pro production release, we will do some pre-check to make sure our operation node and our remote host are, are okay with our uh, changes. And uh, during the changes, we have a rollback script and a policy to make sure just in case if something out of control, we can change the system um, to the normal. The next part is our monitoring system. So we use Antringo and Nagos to monitoring our systems, not only the physical uh, host uh, network switches, but also our um, cloud service APIs. So we also use Tempest to uh, simulate uh, end users' behaviors, for example, uh, create uh, resources. And uh, we also uh, have 724 uh, on-call rotations to make sure we can respond the accident quickly. And uh, the last part is about our cloud cluster. We, as you know, we use Kubernetes and OpenStack as our cloud software. At the meantime, we also the end user of, of the, our public the cluster, we create our developer environment and the test environment on our public cloud to make sure we can feel as our end user feel. <coughs> so all of this about our CI and the CD systems to support the production ready Kubernetes clusters. So uh, let's do some quick demos to show how how end users do uh, create a Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster in a few clicks. Before we uh, take questions, we can give uh, a quick demo uh, how to create a um, Kubernetes cluster. So in our cloud, um, currently we are published, oh, sorry. <laughs> so we have um, two templates, cluster templates. One is um, development template and one is production templates. So I can show you. 
in the production companies. Here we see the, the cluster destroy is a basic uh, like image version and uh, the flavor. So this flavor is for master and this flavor is for work node and image ID and uh, the cumulative size. ID so that you can uh, access your uh, cumulative cluster outside. And Put a name like uh, for LCA and just select uh, a template. The, uh, the master knows number like three and the work knows count like three the dog volume size empty and your key pair so that you can inject the, um, the personal uh, key pair into the, uh, the nose of the cluster so you can access into the nose for debug for whatever. And just submit. It may take like uh, 15 minutes for product, uh, production uh, cluster. So you can pick this one. I just click before the uh, this session as an example. So after click the the cluster, click you can see the basic information that cluster, cluster. And you can also use command line or API to talk to this service and get more um, options. Okay, uh, that's it. Um, we, I think we have three minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Hi, just wonder, do you secure your uh, Kubernetes internal network? Sorry? Do you secure your Kubernetes internal network? I just want to. Do you, um, do you run encryption for internal network? Encryption? Encryption. Yes. Okay, do you have, um, is there any recommendations of what tools or solutions for do, to do that? For, for, for the, you are talking about the network on top of the Kubernetes cluster or the end hood uh, neutral network. I don't quite get that. Uh, um, what I mean is, um, those nodes talk to each other, right? And you, I see you have got node network uh, policies inside, but yeah. uh, some security compliance require uh, internal nodes even to secure talking to each other, like using TLS probably. Do you have a solution for that in, in, in your general cluster? Uh, I don't think we have, we have, we have to, from, from the cloud provider perspective, we don't have to worry about um, the the traffic between your port is basically, as a cloud provider, we just create a cluster for you, and you decide uh, how to handle the, uh, your traffic between your two ports. Okay, thank you. Um, that kind of in part answers one of my questions. So your environment at the moment is it's a Kubernetes cluster per customer or a customer can have multiple Kubernetes clusters. You don't have a shared Kubernetes infrastructure that multiple customers use. Is that right? When, when you user create a, a Kubernetes cluster, you get the virtual machine and the virtual machine is only dedicated for you is not shared with any other tenant. Right, so you're not offering a multi-tenanted Kubernetes environment, it is a Kubernetes environment per customer. Yeah, yeah the, the Kubernetes cluster are created in your tenant. And you place, how do you, do you do any control? You see that the uh, image that you use to spin up Kubernetes comes, or your Kubernetes code is just coming straight from Docker? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So what, are you using Fedora Atomic as the base host, or do you use other Linux flavors as well? Currently we're using um, Fedora Atomic uh, 27. Uh, it's a uh, 
the base uh, operating system to run the Kubernetes cluster. And that means uh, we are building the, the atomic system container just for okay. Kubernetes. And then the Kubernetes that you're pulling, are you just, do you lock it down to a specific build from Docker Hub? Yeah, okay, All right, thanks. So it's, it's fully shared. You can just get it from um, OpenStack, uh, OpenStack Magnum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.